I think I should start this video by explaining exactly who John Constantine is, because I know there's going to be a lot of people out there who are a bit lost. He has gained in popularity over the last couple of years, mostly thanks to Matt Ryan's wonderful portrayal of him, but he's still a lesser known character. I wouldn't say he is unappreciated, but he's definitely underappreciated. So who is John Constantine? Well, I'm going to turn you over to one of the very scant few things the Big Bang Theory actually got right. A morally ambiguous confidence man who smokes, has lung cancer, and is tormented by the spirits of the undead. Oh, and he's also... An accomplished warlock, an expert of the occult, and a master of exorcism. Also a Taurus, for those of you taking notes. So, why do I believe he deserves more appreciation? Well, one, he was the lead character of Hellblazer, which ran for 25 years and 300 issues, so it's amazing to me that he hasn't got more attention. Thank you very much. And I know that I made an entire video about why Keanu Reeves shouldn't be Constantine, but this John Wick clip is just too appropriate to not use. John wasn't exactly the boogeyman. He was the one you sent to kill the fucking boogeyman. Yet John Constantine is not the devil. He is the devil's devil. Don't take my word for it. The devil says it himself. You are my enemy, Constantine. My adversary. My devil. And if you need more convincing about how awesome this guy is, he is the con man who tricked the devil three times. Balls do not get bigger than that. Okay, now we know a little bit more about John. Let's see how Justice League Dark handles him. We start in Washington, D.C. Spooky Washington, D.C where a car accident turns bad and a woman thinks she sees demons and mows them down in the street. Wonder Woman, save me, save me from them! Demons, they're everywhere, don't you see them? I see only one. <sighs> Meanwhile, in spooky Metropolis, a man is threatening his family with a gun and much like the driver earlier, the man claims they're demons as are his neighbours. And after all my complaints about the new 52 movies giving us nothing but children's morality plays, I'm really impressed with the gruesome imagery they're putting on display here without it feeling gratuitous. What have you done? <sighs> Next we are in spooky, no, no, wait, wait, ne ne never mind, it's Gotham, where a woman is about to throw her baby off a church roof. Let me help you. <gasps> right. This just shows you how they screwed up Wonder Woman and Superman. These people are all clearly mentally disturbed in some way, and the two heroes that are meant to exemplify compassion and light, their response to it is, You're the demon here, and what have you done? Whereas Batman's instinct is to say, Let me help you. Not criticizing the writing of Batman here, he is a deceptively compassionate character, and this is totally something he would do. A welcome change from the disappointment that was all the previous Batman movies. It's just the juxtaposition between DC's two lightest characters and one of their darkest that makes this opening four minutes ridiculous. Because other than that, it's a pretty great opening. It manages to shock us with what's going on and intrigues us with the mystery as to why it's happening and it displays the best and often ignored qualities of one of its most beloved heroes. I'm sorry. The colours are considerably darker than what they have been in previous movies without being uninviting, and the imagery, though not a patch on the Vertical Comics, is very serviceable. And I can't say that Batman dressing down Wonder Woman and Superman by saying that they are self-important pricks who don't know shit about real people wasn't cathartic as hell. I recommend spending more time on the streets instead of flying over them. Of course, Batman turns out to be wrong in the end and it is magic, but cathartic nonetheless. Okay, and I love the opening credits and the music. It just has creepy occultist magic written all over it. 
I do still prefer the Constantine TV series opening, but they are pretty similar. Doing a good job so far in New 52 movies. Don't screw it up. So Batman is set off to find... John Constantine, the man who perfected the bad idea. Who is playing poker with some demons. As you do. The scene delivers some very natural sounding character exposition. Are oh, you cheating? <laughs> Technically we both cheated. I just did it better. And the moral of the story is... Don't try to con a Constantine. I really love how John is set up to be a bastard in this, because he forces Jason to transform into the demon he's been trying to contain, and in the end, he's not sorry for it. It could have gone on a killing spree. You don't consider the cost! Yeah, I did. Waited against my being eaten alive and thought, yeah, totally worth it. I don't expect them to go as far as the Vertical Comics and all the fucked up shit that happens in them, but they effectively establish that John is not always a nice person. Back with Batman, he goes to Zatanna to ask for her help in finding Constantine. We find out that Dead Man is the one who has been directing Batman towards Constantine, and we get Dead Man's backstory, which I'm not all that interested in. Basically, he is an acrobat who gets shot and is given the power to possess people by a goddess. So he's a ghost. The team gets chased by a tornado and... Into the house! Z, you alright? Yeah, as soon as you get off me. They are just getting down to talking about the goings-on when... Oh. Hey, I told you not to do that, Orchid. Use a bloody door. The house decides to say hello. How new is this one? And I love how Zatanna just immediately assumes she's one of John's conquests. For some reason, she decides to play Pam Reader and tells the group all about themselves. Angry at John. Yet, you still have feelings for him. <laughs> she just told everyone your deepest, darkest secret. <laughs> you must be so embarrassed. <laughs> do me, do me, do me. Constantine is characteristically reluctant to join the team, but again, characteristically decides if other people want to get themselves killed, it's not worth the argument. And they go to see John's old friend Richie, who is dying. Again, these writers really seem to have a good understanding of Constantine, in the sense that anyone who gets close to him reaps consequences for it, whether they be John's fault or not. John and Z poke around this poor sod's memories to see how his madness began. Meanwhile, Batman and Boston fight. <laughs> that. Richie Natalie escapes death, and we get Jason's backstory, which is basically, once I was a young knight, and Merlin put a demon inside me to guard against a guy named Destiny. And we find out it's Destiny's dreamstone that has apparently been making these people see horrific things. And apparently Merlin and Camelot were kicking about around the time of Henry VIII. For 500 years I've been bound to Etrigan. Okay. Richie tells them it was Felix Faust who attacked him, and they look him up in the wizarding yellow pages. But there's apparently some kind of magical cloaking device stopping John from finding him, so they go ask for help from... What are you doing in my swamp? Now, I don't take much issue with Satana, at least it's not as much as Starfire, but we have another blank model female character. I explained in Justice League vs Teen Titans why that is such an annoying trope. But I can't blame the writers too much for Zatanna because from what few comics I've read with her in them, her most interesting trait seems to be her troubling attraction to mentally unwell men. <coughs> Daddy issues. But this is the part of the film when it gets annoying. You have a garden. Yes, and I water it every week. I have a garden. And I water it every day. But I'm happy to see Swamp Thing, even though he really is only here so they can pull out a trump card in the final battle. But that voice. John Constantine. Ooh, tingles. For those of you who don't know, 
John made his first comic book appearance in Swamp Thing issue number 37. Faust ultimately turns out to be a red herring, but who dares? Boy, is he fun. As if I would stoop to brawling with a demon. Fight others of your filthy kind. Sword magic, really? It's the TV dinner of spellcasting, dear. And the animation in this segment is just beautiful. And we get another well done and touching interaction between Z and John before we find out that Richie was telling tall tales and he has made a deal with Destiny, who takes over his body. Now, the one thing that has really bothered me in this series is that the climactic battles have been overly long and overly samey. This one is actually quite unique, not only because they're using magic, but they defeat a much more powerful opponent by tricking him. They can't break through Destiny's barrier. They call Etrigan. Constantine calls once more, just like a greedy wanton. Save the bloody rhymes and top that git! Killjoy. Who can't break through it either. They call Swamp Thing, who is separated from Alec Holland. And they win basically because John annoys Destiny enough to get close to him so that Boston can possess him and Jason can stab him. Richie gets dragged to hell, Jason dies of his old wounds, Batman invites Z and John to join the Justice League, John being infinitely amused by that, and John and Z go to have a drink. <sighs> I'm sorry, I just really, really enjoyed that. Not since Flashpoint have I enjoyed a New 52 movie this much. And Flashpoint isn't even really a part of this timeline. So, final thoughts. Is there anything bad? There are a couple of things. For one, there is too much Batman. But at least there is great characterization, just displaying his kindness. And, hallelujah, displaying his sense of humour. What's happening? If this were a computer, I'd say it's frozen. Cheers. For those of you who think Batman is completely devoid of humour, I point to this hilarious panel where he comes back from the dead and sees that Jim Gordon has been functioning in his place, and his response is, Jim, who died and made you Batman? Now for the plot. It's a bad mystery. They should have set Richie up as the villain earlier on, so it would feel more like a mystery trying to unravel it. And that would have given Batman a greater reason to be there because they could have utilised his detective skills more to advance the plot rather than just doing stuff in the background. Boston straddles the line between enduring and annoying with a slight lean towards annoying without being insufferable. And John and Z's relationship was so well done. They managed to portray that without having to do a this is what happened style flashback. Through the writing and the voice acting, we don't need to be told what their shared past was like. We know. Ah, this, this is the monkey cage in Sumatra all over again. Oh, we need to save the monkey, she said. Boston and Batman were really kind of superfluous. They were both given things to do and made themselves useful in terms of getting things done, but this is John and Z's movie. <laughs> you could play a drinking game with how many times Batman grunts. I really like John and Batman's relationship because in the comics, Batman is one of the few people who actually likes John. Not everything can be solved with your pea shooter. <laughs> I take it back, that thing is useful. In so far as Batman likes anyone, I suppose. There are a lot of detours, but those that aren't used to advance the plot are used to advance the characters or just do something really cool. This is the first movie since Flashpoint where I was actually interested in the plot. Though I am willing to admit it could have been constructed better, but still, I was invested in what was happening. A couple of things didn't make sense, like Jason's age, the fact that he seemed to hate and fear Etrigan, but by the end it was like they were best friends. Etrigan even mopes over it in Apocalypse War. Swamp Thing is separated from Alec and 
doesn't seem to get him back, as far as I could see. But again, we see him in later movies. Doesn't the green need an avatar to function the way that he does? Anyway, I love this movie. Maybe I'm biased, but I just thought the characters were well done, despite the problems the plot was interesting, the action was good, and most importantly, it was different. I may or may not be cutting this movie a lot of slack because it has a few of the same problems that all the other New 52 movies had, but there was more than enough there to enjoy. Let's hope my good mood remains and see how the New 52 movie series tackles the most famous Teen Titans storyline ever. Thank you all for listening. Just a quick message. My Patreon is now back up and running and I have my first ever Patreon request video right here if you'd like to check it out. It is a really good one. Not like my usual content, but well worth the watch. So if anyone would like to pledge support to my Patreon, that's in the description box below. If not, please like and subscribe. That helps too. And thank you everyone for supporting me. I just had a few hundred extra subscribers and I am so happy about that. So as I promised in my Aquaman review, I'm going to start working on Constantine City of Demons because that was my pledge for reaching 100 subscribers and we have well past that. So thank you everyone who subscribed. Thank you again. Patreon's below if you can afford support. If not, like and subscribe and thank you, thank you again. I hope you're all safe and well and I will see you in the next video.